I'm just back from Micro Center, and this is the Gigabyte Aero TRX 50D. Or TRX 50 Aero D. There's only three TRX 50 motherboards launching for Threadripper high end desktop, and I've already taken a look at the other two. This is the one from Gigabyte, and it's different. It's really different. Perfect for design and AI. Well, you know, if you're gonna run a lot of AI, you want a lot of GPUs, and I don't, I don't know if you got the memo on that, but the GPUs, they need PCIe slots, and I'm only counting three. Three PCIe X16 for multi-GPU. All right, first up, I gotta say, I like what Gigabyte is doing with the box. TRX50 Aero D, perfect for design and AI. STR5 socket, RDIM memories, Threadripper. Threadripper is kinda high in desktop, although the least expensive Threadripper you can get is $1,500 for 24 cores, but you're probably gonna be spending $25, $2,600 for 32 cores, or $5,000 plus for even more cores, because you're a creative professional, and you can get by on four memory channels, but this is also the most aggressively priced, least expensive TRX50 motherboard, at least at launch. What do you get? Well, it's a 16 plus eight plus four power phase. Uh, don't worry, we're gonna be overclocking with the 64 core CPU just to see what it does. And we've got, you know, three PCIe slots, two PCI Express 16 lane by five, and one PCI Express 4.0, also 16 lanes. Like the reason you buy Threadripper is because you get lots of PCIe lanes. Super weird, in my opinion, that there's only three slots on this motherboard, but it does also have four M.2, two Gen 5, two Gen 4, as well as USB 4. Now get this, the USB 4 solution is Thunderbolt. Well, it's not Thunderbolt, we can't call it Thunderbolt, but it does actually use Intel's JLH chipset to deliver that. It doesn't use AMD's native USB 4 solution. It, I kind of get why though, USB 4, in the 7000 series AMD mobile CPUs is quite good, shockingly good. Uh, Intel's coming out with Thunderbolt 5, that'll be nice, Thunderbolt 5 chipset, so on and so forth. We're probably, what, six months a year out on that? Uh, I'm not really sure, but 40 gigabit, Thunderbolt 3 slash 4, PCIe tunneling, basically. PCIe tunneling on those mobile CPUs is great, and the 8000 series mobile CPUs is getting ready to come out also pretty awesome from what I've heard. But I guess the engineering team working on that didn't have time to deal with it on Threadripper or it's designed in such a way that it needs an iGPU and because this is Threadripper, there's no iGPU, there's no built-in GPU in a Threadripper CPU, so there's not really a graphics path. Conveniently enough, the Intel chipset has DisplayPort and if you check out the rear I.O. on this, there is a single DisplayPort in which will route to one of your USB-C ports so that you can run the full Thunderbolt experience even through an add-in GPU. That's pretty awesome. So you have a little jumper cable that goes from your, whatever GPU you're, you're using. You know, you can use an Intel GPU, AMD GPU, Nvidia GPU, whatever, into the motherboard, and then that USB-C port, it's true full fat Thunderbolt. And this is actually pretty important for creative types, like creative workstation people, because a lot of the audio and video gear does actually use a Thunderbolt interface. And it's sort of cute and fun when AMD's the underdog, it's like, you know, haha, they're bringing up their PCIe tunneling interface. But the PCIe tunneling has become so good when it's implemented correctly, big if, uh, on the 7000 series CPUs that I think that it should be easier for board partners to implement USB 4 on Threadripper. And of the other boards that I have, ASRock can support Thunderbolt through an add in card. I'm sorry, PCIe tunneling. They can support PCIe tunneling through an add-in card, uh, which is gonna be an external non-AMD chipset. The non-AMD chipset built right in to this motherboard, and Gigabyte has done the qualification stuff to make sure that that works correctly. We'll take that for a spin in a little bit, don't worry. But it's not as fun when AMD's not the underdog. I mean, maybe the torch has been passed as far as workstation goes. So AMD being the leader here is gonna have to step up and act like the leader and not the plucky little underdog, you know, figuring this stuff out and it's assigned to a single developer or a couple of developers that, you know, just sort of get it done and figure it out. And it's like, oh, this is amazing. Two people figured out how to implement PCIe tunneling and we're good to go. Uh, those days are past us because 64, 96 cores, you could run the Pro Series CPUs on that. If you're not read in, this is a four memory channel platform. You always wanna use it with four memory channels. You can use it with two DIMMs, but four memory channels. Threadripper Pro is eight memory channels. You could run it with four or eight memory channels. You can run th Pro CPUs in these boards, but if you're gonna splash out to get a Pro CPU, you probably should get a Pro Series motherboard. The time that I'm shooting this video, can't get my hands on any WRX motherboards 
from anybody. And in fact, these motherboards were late. They were about two weeks behind the actual CPU launches, which again, is funny when you're a plucky underdog, but when you're literally carrying the torch for workstations, not really acceptable. Wasn't really true of OEMs, Dell, HP, and somewhat later Lenovo all got their workstation products launched a little early, a little ahead of system integrators. So probably not a thing in OEM land, like the polish and all the stuff is there in terms of like workstation. But I also don't like that DIY people maybe feel like a second class citizen if OEMs are able to get it out that much earlier. Although it is way better than having the OEMs get it out so much earlier than, because like when Threader Pro launched, the, the DIY channel it was not, it was Lenovo only for a long time, Lenovo exclusive, which might have been a deal that AMD had to make to get the engineering resources. Not really sure. Again, in the underdog situation, that's way different than market leader. But to be sure, these are market leaders now. Like, you're gonna invest in your own product, AMD, because you're the, you know, this is, this is so far and away beyond what you can get yeah, I don't know, fun times. Anyway, let's just talk about the motherboard. Yeah, so power phase delivery here. Of the other two motherboards that I've taken a look at, this is kind of the weakest power delivery, but it is a 16 plus eight plus four, which means that you do have room for overclocking. Technically, 32, 64, 96 core CPUs, those are all 350 watt, and they use 350 watt right on the button. But if you let the, especially 32 and 96 core, well, uh, 64 and 96 core, use more power, they'll really sing and they tend to be pretty stable. So overclocking, are you gonna overclock your workstation? Nah, it's probably not a good idea. But if you're buying this, nah, maybe. But then again, $2,500 for processor when you do overclocking, I mean, it might be fun. It might be sort of interesting. The idea with PBO is that you just turn on PBO and you let AMD do its own overclocking and it's like, okay, you won the silicon lottery and the CPU tells you, it's like, you won $200, you won $3. You want $1,000, your processor's $1,000 better. PBO is not supposed to punish you with instability. And, you know, for the version of PBO that we're on, basically that's true, except when it's not, when you're trying to use like SRIOV or a high-end networking card or PCIe peripheral or it introduces a RAM instability, but mostly it's true. And it seems to be even more true than ever on this platform. So good job overclocking team. You are seen, you are noticed. It is amazing. I also like that this board has four M.2. Some of the boards for TRX50 only have two M.2. This is two Gen 5 and two Gen 4. The slot layout here also, I'll explicitly mention, you can run two dual slot cards and still have room between them. So if you're gonna run like RTX 6000 cards for AI, that whole, you know, design for AI, you can do that. And yeah, AMD workstation cards, they're a thing. The Instinct, the MI300 thing has happened or is happening and woohoo, look at those MI300s. Uh, AMD is coming for the AI uh, market, it seems like. And dual slot workstation cards are a thing from AMD as well. The primary X16 slot is super reinforced to the point that it is screwed into the motherboard. So I guess that might be good for SIs and system integrators that want to ship with a GPU installed. We've also gone fully toolless for our M.2, at least the two that are in this area, which is really super nice. Oh yeah, these are, these are toolless as well. We have eight six gigabit per second SATA ports. Uh, USB Type-C, which just barely clears your GPU. If your GPU's got a thick backplate and your Type-C cable is, it's gonna be a little rough there. And then you get a, a, your 20-pin front panel connection. You get seven fan headers at the bottom edge of the motherboard and three at the front edge of the motherboard. There's also a noise input. You can plug a microphone into the motherboard and the motherboard will monitor the noise of your case from inside. Don't worry, that's a closed loop circuit. It's not, it's not wired up to process audio or be an Alexa smart speaker or anything. And it comes with a jumper installed, so you don't have to use that by default. But the uh, noise sensor lets you listen for fan noise, and that's one of the things you can set in the BIOS to be like, hey, try not to have any fan noise, but otherwise run the fans as high as you can for the optimal noise, which is cool that the motherboard can just help you figure that out. For 16 plus eight plus four, 105 amp power stages, power delivery, we have three giant heat sinks and they're all connected with a heat pipe. So it's this U-shaped heat sink. There is no fan or anything like that, as far as I can tell, but it does have this sort of interesting see-through sandwich. So it's meant for a lot of airflow. Now, do I think this motherboard is one that you should be dumping a thousand watts into your CPU as you can on the other two TRX50 motherboards? Uh, the answer is no. Both of the other TRX50 motherboards that were out at launch time support dual power supply in one way or another. 
While this motherboard has dual 8-pin power connectors, it does not have an auxiliary power input for your second GPU, because remember, if you do run a dual or even a triple GPU, you're gonna be consuming 75 watts per slot. I would go so far as to not recommend a triple GPU configuration for this motherboard, because 75, 150, 225 watts for three GPUs in this config, uh-uh, 150 is pushing it. You do get a DisplayPort jumper cable for your Thunderbolt interface, as I was explaining before. Four six gigabit per second SATA cables. Two passive thermal sensors for the passive thermal headers on board, and the aforementioned microphone, which you can locate somewhere inside your case. And I think I'm actually gonna use that in my build. You also get a pretty decent Wi-Fi antenna solution. It's both antennas integrated into a single antenna. It is movable, it's not the cheaper rubber duck style, but it might have been nicer to have something something a little nice. Oh, look, and we get four more, four more SATA cables. There was, there was two chambers of SATA cables. You also get a case badge and a, the Gigabyte G connector which is pretty awesome. Basically, you shove your front panel cables into this and you shove this into your motherboard, which makes assembling your PC slightly easier. Now, if you have not been read into the TRX50 platform, you should watch some of my other videos, but in a nutshell, the memory is different. Registered error correcting memory is basically the same as server memory, and that's how you can get a terabyte of memory in this platform, even with only just four sockets. Bear in mind those 256 gig DIMMs at the time that I'm shooting this video are gonna cost you 2,500 to $3,000 each, but 128 gig DIMMs are not entirely unreasonable. For this configuration, I'm actually gonna go with uh, 64 gigs, I think, two, see, so four, 16, yeah, yeah, uh, 64 gigs, which is 16 gig DIMMs, which you can get up to DDR5 6400. <laughs> if you're rocking a, you know, a 7800X 3D or the highest end, you know, Intel 13900K, 14900K, uh, yeah, the gaming performance is gonna be better at 1080p than on this platform because the single thread speed is so high. But with these CPUs, well, the 64 core CPU, the single thread speed's not quite as high, but the 32 core CPU that I have will turbo up to 5.8 on just a few cores, even with a tower cooler. The uh, Arctic 4UM tower cooler, for you know, 5.8 gigahertz in your gaming scenarios is not unrealistic. It's actually pretty cool. For my memory kits, I've been using Kingston Beast Fury and G-Skill Zeta R5 DDR5 DIMMs. It is very nice to see register error correcting memory with gamer features like being able to run beyond JEDEC standards. Excellent. Let's get this mounted in a case. For my build, I'm gonna put it in a fractal case, but I forgot to connect my front panel connectors. Now this motherboard has a 10 gig uh, Quantia, with Marvell at this point, and a two and a half gig NIC built in, real tech. So got plenty of network connectivity, got plenty of USB connectivity. I'm uh, using an ARC GPU because I'm a masochist for just a moment. Hey, our GPU arcs come a long way. The DDR5 initial training still takes a little bit on initial boot, but once you get it trained, the boot time has improved dramatically since the launch of DDR5 in general. And DDR5 server memory still trains really well, quickly, relatively, uh, versus the pure desktop non-registered ECC DDR5 counterparts, in my opinion. Now, if you are running a Gen 5 SSD, notice my GPU layout. I'm actually not using it in the top slot, although the, the Gigabyte manual explicitly recommends the top slot for the GPU. But you could run it in the second slot, as I'm doing here, and have better airflow for your M.2. It's really weird that they recommend the top one. You might have noticed that I've 3D printed a fan bracket on the inside here. I've got 140 millimeter fan that's just blowing over the RAM and the VRM. DDR5, registered ECC DDR5 memory is a little strange. It will start to thermal throttle much past about 55 to 60 degrees C. You don't always get an indicator that your memory is throttling, uh, which is unfortunate. You'll just have less performance than you should. So I've 3D printed a bracket that holds a fan at 45 degrees to help cool the motherboard for my testing and everything else. It's really handy. You should have one too, depending on what your case is. I think the Fractal Torrent uh, and some of the other more high airflow cases would probably be a better choice for a build this modest, but the, uh, the Meshify version of this uh, Fractal case was on sale. It's the XL, uh, so it's fine. You can also use larger CFM fans at the front to uh, provide additional airflow over the motherboard, that'd probably be fine. But running like the Crucial T700, it gets warm. And the heat sinks for the M.2 here, if it's running just one by itself, okay. But if you're running two of them, you're gonna just set up RAID. Don't set up AMD RAID. AMD RAID is, 
it's o it's okay. It's not fabulous, but they've got some work to do there. Um, but if you did set up dual crucial T700 Gen 5 SSDs in like a RAID 0 or a RAID 1, especially with the GPU in the way here, it's probably not going to get enough cooling. You're probably going to get throttling in the T700. Look for that in your build if you do that. Now as far as the Gigabyte BIOS goes, it's got a little bit of a visual facelift. It's also true that all of the AMD options, CXL, RES, you know, secure encrypted virtualization memory, the, the options for the Epic platform basically, it's all here. I can't tell that, like if you turn on CXL and try to shove a CXL device in, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is supposed to work, but yeah, the options there, man, time will tell. Maybe I can get my hands on some more CXL devices and, and try some stuff. I don't wanna, I can't, I can't share everything yet, but hey, maybe it's a thing. PCIe bifurcation for all three X16 slots supports X8, 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 X4, X4, which is rare. It's rare to find that option and X4, 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 X4. So if you wanted to run some crazy 8 M.2 RAID setup, theoretically, you could with this motherboard. Really recommend Linux for that. Like if you're gonna build a Linux workstation around this motherboard, you're gonna have a good time. It's gonna be great. You're gonna run Linux MD, you're not gonna fool with AMD software RAID, and it's gonna run like a bat out of hell because it's, you know, crazy insane thread ripper. Uh, 200 gigabytes per second with your DDR5 6400 for your memory bandwidth is entirely attainable on this platform. How nuts is that? So, yeah, fun times. All right, with our liquid cooler, let's do some overclocking. So how about that PBO and power delivery and that sort of thing? Well, it's actually surprisingly competent. Our 64 core, remember, baseline 350 watts, if you're gonna run it as totally stock, this board is completely 100% fine. Where it tops out at is around 600 watts. 650 watts, maybe. At 650 watts, you really are gonna need good cooling around your motherboard. This 140 millimeter fan with three printed thing, basically that's okay. 650 watts, I think, is the upper limit. It's not like the other TRX50 boards that are available at launch time where you could dump a thousand watts of overclock into your processor. That said, I'm using this extra thick 360 millimeter radiator with a custom loop to carry the heat away and at 600 watts I can PBO with this all day long. And our normal PBO workload is not gonna really get super close to 600 watts. So with PBO, the performance on this board isn't quite as good as some of the other TRX boards. But for everything under that, this board does not disappoint. It actually performs really well. So unless you really need a lot of PCIe slots, this is the least expensive, but still very competent motherboard that also includes an Intel Thunderbolt solution, I'm sorry, PCIe tunneling solution that you can just plug whatever in to those USB 4 ports, audio mixer, whatever, basically have it work. You also got the BIOS options for that to set it to no security mode, which is the least likely to create a headache for you. You could enable the more advanced USB 4 modes, but probably the older USB peripherals that you have, especially if you're running, you know, like you know, Thunderbolt 2 and you want to shove Thunderbolt, an old Thunderbolt 2 device into this new modern USB 4, that is sometimes fraught with frustration and headache, but you stand a better chance of that working when it's in no security mode. Really with that, this motherboard doesn't leave a lot to be desired. It's pretty cool in its M.2 connectivity. It's reasonable in its power delivery. If even, be, I mean, it wouldn't be inaccurate to say that the power delivery is actually overbuilt for 350 watts of power. So it's fine. 24, 32, 64 cores, no problem. If you're splashing out for the 96 core, because you can use those pro CPUs in here, remember, just go ahead and get the WRX motherboard. You're not, it doesn't, in no universe does it make sense to not get a WRX motherboard if you are getting a pro threader for CPU. Uh, it, would, it would be an edge case. It would be an exception to the rule. Overall, pretty impressive result from Gigabyte for our, uh, our uh, TRX50 motherboard here. Nicely done. I'm Willis Level 1. It's been a quick look at the TRX ROD from Gigabyte TRX50. Uh, can't wait to get my hands on the WRX boards from Gigabot and everybody else. Stay tuned for that. All right, I'm Willis Level 1. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. And if you want me to do something special, do a test workload, whatever, let me know. We'll do it.